This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. You may be wondered why I have this um, logo, this picture here of war on disinformation instead of Joggler 66. Well, that's because this is just my second channel and I, I chose to read this book first on my second channel instead of my first channel because on my first channel I have so, 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 so many videos to upload. I cannot, I possibly cannot put this new book reading of History of the Inquisition, which we are going to read the, the next part today on the 11th of April 2017. I just cannot publish this book reading on my first channel because of so many other videos I have to do there. So... It will first be published on my second channel, and that channel is called War on Disinformation, the name I gave to it a few years ago as I thought I needed a backup channel because of a few copyright strikes on my first channel. Now, a few days ago, I think uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, you know, my memory doesn't work that well anymore. <laughs> uh, a few days ago, I ordered a book, and yesterday, I think it was, I received the book. And that book was a book that was mentioned in another book that I received uh, even a few days earlier from my uh, brother in Christ, Brett Norman, from the United States of America. He sent me eight books. And one of the books was a booklet, actually. It has about uh, 67 pages. It's called The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. Now, let me see if I can... Uh, if I find a picture of that book cover, maybe here. I don't know. I don't even think. No, it's it's not here. Um, I didn't I didn't scan that in yet. But it doesn't matter. It's a book, the origin of futurism and preterism, and that is a book that I'm gonna start reading tomorrow, uh, together with Tom Fress, if uh, he uh, tells me what time that we are going to meet on Skype. 
Brett Norman doesn't have the time to join us this week, but he will later join us also in the reading of this booklet, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. And in this book, uh, on page, if I'm not mistaken, 46, let me just have a look. Yeah, on page 46 it says, For a more thorough explanation of the historicist interpretation and the book of Revelation, please order the book entitled The Book of Revelation from an Israelite and Historicist Interpretation, which is available from this ministry, and that is uh, uh, the same author, Charles A. Jennings. So, after receiving that book from my brother, Brett Norman, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, I ordered the book, The Book of Revelation, from an Israelite and historicist interpretation. And I already read through the first 15 pages or something like yesterday, and there are some fold-outs in that book, um, which I will all scan, and um, that are actually, uh, I can show you here, I think I scanned yesterday one. Um... Was it this one? No, it's not this one. <laughs> um, what was the name? I did that yesterday with uh, historicism, I think. Historicism must be the key word. Historicist view. Yeah, you see this? This is the one. This is one of the foldouts, um, or that's the first foldout of that book, the book of Revelation from an Israelite and historicist interpretation that I scanned yesterday. And here you can see, of course, how the biblical historicist view of Daniel's 70-week uh, history prophecy, uh, especially the 70th week, which has been completely fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ, 70 um, 2,000 years ago, the 70th week, you can see here, in AD 27, the end of the 69th week, and then there is not a 2,000 year gap, and in 34 AD, seven years, you have the 70th week, which was three and a half years, the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ on this earth, that we can read about in uh, the Gospel books of the New Testament of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you had the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the writing of the book of Revelation in 95-96 AD by the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. And then you have the history that we are living in right now, the book of Revelation being fulfilled in the history of Western Europe. And Antichrist is revealed in political, economic and religious governmental systems. So... Because we know Revelation 17 speaks about um, the harlot and Babylon and that is the Roman Catholic Church. So this is actually a picture of the historicist view of history and not the, raw, the wrong taught, um, how am I going to say that, <laughs> uh, the wrong taught futurist idea of a future Antichrist who comes just seven years before Christ's, uh, uh, Christ's return. Well, nobody knows when Christ returns. He said that only the Father knows, so... Um, I don't even know how they want to play that tribulation out. For anybody who can read their Bible, they do not fall for that um, deception. But, you know, uh, the reformers all knew who the Antichrist was, and today nobody knows anymore who the Antichrist was or is, or nobody identifies the papacy with the Antichrist anymore. They just don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to go too far away from uh, reading the history of the Inquisition because that's what you came for. That's why you're looking, why you're watching this video. But in this book, uh, the book of Revelation from an Israelite and historicist interpretation, there was a little pamphlet in there. No, not a pamphlet even, just a, just a little paper. And on that paper was written a brief of the commandments. It's this one. So I can use that, of course, as a bookmark. So wherever I, I stop, I can put this paper and I see, oh, I have to go reading further in here. But I just love it when I read this. You know that Jesus Christ, of course, brought the Ten Commandments down to just two, saying, love your Father who is in heaven with all your heart and might and soul and power. Yeah? And, of course, if you do that, you will adhere to the Ten Commandments and uh, the first four, and he said, and uh, the second commandment is, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And this, um, of course, uh, entails the other six commandments that we can read here. Now, this little 
paper that was put in the book and that I very much appreciate says, as you have probably read already without needing me to read it for you, a brief of the Ten Commandments. So Jesus shortened it up into two commandments and this one shortens just the commandments up to bring them down to the essential point. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not, though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. From Covenant Books I really like this much, this uh, little paper very much, and I wanted to give you a little bit of the story, how I came to that, and why I put this in here. Because, you know, the book, The History of the Inquisition, deals most and for all with commandment-keeping Christians. The persecution throughout the ages has been on people who keep the commandments. All ten of them. Not only to admire just one God and don't take any images and don't take the name of God in vain and keep the Sabbath, but all the Ten Commandments they were keeping. And those were the persecuted. Those were the persecuted that we read of in the history of the Inquisition. That's why I read that book. That's why I love to read the book. And that's why I want to go continue in that book right now, even though I have had, or had almost 10 minutes of an introduction. Forgive me for that. But I thought that was necessary also to do once. Now, <coughs> going back to the book, the history of the Inquisition. We last time we stranded on page 107, the right, uh, the the red marked uh, letters here, as you can see. And I'm going to continue right here. If you think uh, it appropriate to start uh, again a little bit earlier, then you can read that for yourself. Take your book that you probably have downloaded with you, along with you, and read along with me while I try to read this very hard to read book, as I often told you already. And then we're going to see what we are going, what we are going to learn today. So the author continues on the second paragraph on page 107 of the book History of the Inquisition, written in 1692 and translated by Samuel Chandler in 1731. The truth is, this method of preventing error will suit all religions and all sorts of principles whatsoever and is that by which error maintains its ground and is indeed rendered impregnable. All the different sorts of Christians, all the different sorts of Papists and Protestants, Greeks, Lutherans, Calvinists and Armenians cannot certainly be right in their discriminating principles. A very important sentence and this is why I highlighted this here also. All the different sorts of Christians, today they speak about so-called quote-unquote denominations, Papists, which are Roman Catholics, and Protestants, who came out of the Roman Catholic Church to protest the Roman Catholic Church in the beginning, Greeks, meaning all other heathen, Lutherans, Calvinists, who are both quote-unquote denominations of the apostate whore, of Babylon, and Armenians cannot certainly be right in their discriminating principles. No, that's exactly the point that one has to make. They cannot be right, because they all lay the emphasis on their doctrinal um, understanding in another way. Whereas we have to understand it is only and only sola scriptura. There are a lot of people who say uh, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Jesus, sola this, sola that. Well, I tell you sola scriptura is the most important because in the scripture all the other points are mentioned. So I only need this one point, sola scriptura, no more, no less but surely also no more. 
If I add anything to that, that will give the possibility even uh, open up for discussion. You know, I don't do that. I adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone. The Bible is my standard of uh, consciousness because it is God's, uh, God's word. So that means that God's word is my basis for my consciousness. And all the different sorts of Christians, Papists and Protestants, Greek, Lutherans, Calvinists and Armenians cannot certainly be right in their discriminating principles. No, because they do not adhere to the one and only principle that there should be, actually, and that means adhere to the word of God. Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. And yet, where shall we find any clergy that don't pretend a right to impose subscriptions and who don't, do not maintain the truth of the articles which they make such subscriptions necessary? Upon this foot, the doctrines of the Council of Trent, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, we'll go into that a little bit later, and the Assembly's Confession of Faith are all of them equally true, Christian and sacred. <laughs> For they are in different places embraced as standards of orthodoxy, and their sacredness and authority secured and maintained by the subscriptions of the clergy to them. And therefore, I think it is a little agreeable, it is, uh, uh, and therefore I think it as little agreeable to prudence as it is to justice for Christians to keep up a practice that may be so easily and hath been so often turned into a security for heresy, superstition and idolatry, and especially for Protestants who wear no any longer these marks of slavery which their enemies, whenever they have power, will not fail to make use of, either to fetter their consciences or distinguish them for their for the burning. Now, this one sentence here with the Council of Trent, upon this foot, uh, meaning, yet we shall find any clergy that don't pretend the right to impose subscriptions and who do not maintain the truth of articles to which they make such subscriptions necessary, upon this foot, the doctrines of the Council of Trent, the 39 articles of the Church of England, the Assembly's Confession of Faith, are all of them equally true. Well, the doctrines of the Council of Trent are all equally true only to the Roman Catholic Church. I want you to surely understand that. Because the Council of Trent ended with 125 anathemas spoken against Protestants, spoken against the, really, the real truth. And the 39 Articles of the Church of England are very Catholic friendly. We're going to go into that a little bit later here uh, at this little note that I took. They're all equally true. Yes, they are all equally true for the Orthodox, for the Roman Catholic Church, not for Bible-believing Christians. Let's just understand that correctly, please. So in the last... Uh, Paragraph of page uh, 107, the author continues, But it may be said that the abuse of subscriptions is no argument against the use of them, and that as they are proper to discover what means sentiments are, uh, what, what means, sorry, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to start that sentence again. <laughs> but it may be said that the abuse of subscriptions is no argument against the use of them, and that as they are proper to discover what means sentiments are, they may be so far sometimes a guard and security to the truth. But as all parties who use them will urge this reform for them, what they are in possession of the truth, and therefore willing to do all they can to secure and promote it. Of consequence, subscriptions to articles of faith can never be looked on properly as guards to real truth, but as guards to certain prevailing principles, whether true or false. And even in this case, they are wholly ineffectual. The clergy of the Church of England are bound to subscribe the 39 Articles, i.e. to the truth of Athanasian and Calvinistic principles. But, what, but has this subscription answered its end? 
And I'm going to read to you a little comment that I made. Those 39 articles of the Anglican Church are very Roman Catholic pleasing. I urge everyone to read them. Now you can Google them online, the 39 articles of the Anglican Church. I urge everyone to read them and compare to biblical teachings. And you will probably come to the same conclusion as I have. Even taking into consideration that Anglican bishops Mortimer and Ridley, who were burned at the stake for their heresies, were co-authors of them, <coughs> I cannot subscribe to them, the 39 articles of the Anglican Church. Sola Scriptura is all I subscribe to, as I already made my point a little bit earlier in this video. But hey, that's me. And um, your conscience should tell you what you have to do. And as I told you, my conscience is based on the book of, uh, on, on the Holy Writ, on the Word of God, on the Bible. And if your conscience is too, you will probably come to the same conclusion. There is only one truth, and that's the Bible. Do not the clergy, the author continues, who are all subscribers, and who often repeat their subscriptions, differ about these heads as much as if they had never subscribed at all? Men that have no principles of religion and virtue, but enter the church only with a view to the benefices and preferments of it, will subscribe 10,000 times over, and to many articles that can be given them, whether true or false, because they only go there for their own personal gain. Thus, the Asiatic bishops subscribed to the condemnation of the decrees of the Council of Chalcedon, and inform Bel uh, Basilicus, Basiliscus, yeah, Basiliscus, the emperor, that their subscriptions were voluntarily. And yet, when Basis, uh, Basiliscus was deposed, they immediately subscribed to, truth, uh, to the truth of those decrees and swore their first subscription was involuntary. Huh? You got that? Let's read it again. Huh? And yet, when Basiliscus was deposed, the emperor was disposed of, they immediately subscribed to the truth of those decrees and swore their first subscription was involuntary. Well, as a Bible-believing Christian, we do not swear. That's another point. So that subscriptions cannot keep out any atheist, infidels or profligate persons. Yeah, I wrote a little note here, mental reservations, that subscriptions, like when you say, I adhere to the 39 articles of the, Catholic, uh, of the Anglican Church, or I adhere to this, or I adhere to that, those subscriptions cannot keep out any atheists, infidels, or profligate persons, which I also like to give the term Jesuits, because they will just use mental reservation when subscribing to these principles. Okay? And as to others, daily experience teaches us that they either disbelieve the articles they subscribe, subscribing them only as articles of peace, or else that after they have subscribed them, they see reason upon a more Mature, uh, mature deliberation to alter their minds and change their original opinions. So that till men can be brought always to act upon conscience, never to subscribe what they do not believe, nor ever to alter their judgment as to the articles they have subscribed. Subscriptions are as impertinent and useless as they are unreasonable and can never answer the purposes of those who impose them. But I apprehend farther that this imposing of subscriptions is not only an unreasonable custom, but attended with many very pernicious consequence consequences. It's a great hindrance to that freedom and impartiality of inquiry 
of inquiry, which is the unalterable duty of every man, and necessary to render his religion reasonable and accept uh, acceptable. For why should any person make any inquiries for his own information, when his betters have drawn up a religion for him, and thus kindly saved him the labor and pains? And as his worldly interest may greatly depend on his doing as he is bid, and subscribing as he is ordered, is it not reasonable to think that the generality will contently take everything upon thrust, trust and prudently refrain from creating to themselves scruples and doubts by nicely examining <clears throat> what they are to set their hands to, lest they should miss the of promotion they should miss of promotion for not being able to comply with the condition of it, or enjoy their promotions with a dissatisfied and uneasy conscience. Subscriptions will, I own, sometimes prove marks of distinction and as walls of separation. For though men of integrity and conscience may, and oftentimes undoubtedly do, submit to them, yet men of no principles, or very loose ones, worldly and ambitious men, the thoughtless and ignorant will most certainly do it when they find it to their interest. Again, a description of the Jesuits. The church that encloses herself with these fences leaves abundant room for the entrance of persons of such character. To whom then doth the uh, does uh, to whom then does she refuse admittance? If she opens her gate wildly, by every one letting subscribe to their principles. Interesting question. To whom then does she refuse admittance? Why is it, if to any, it must be to men who cannot bend their consciences to their interest, who cannot believe without examination nor subscribe any articles of faith as true, without understanding and believing them? Tis in the very nature of subscriptions to exclude none, but these, and to distinguish such only for shame and punishment. How is this consistent with anything that is called reason or religion? If there could be found any wise and reasonable methods to throw out the Christian church and ministry, men who are in their hearts unbelievers, who abide in the church only for the revenues the, uh, she yields to them, who shift their religions and political principles according to their interest, who propagate doctrines inconsistent with the liberties of mankind, and are scandalous and immortal in their lives, if subscriptions could be made to answer these ends, and these only, and to throw infamy upon such men, and upon such men only, no one would have anything to allege against the use of them. Whereas, in truth, subscriptions are the great securities of such profligate wretches, who, by complying with them, enter into the church, and thereby share in all the temporal advantages of it, whilst the scrupulous, conscientious Christian is the only one she excludes, who thinks the word of God a more sure rule of faith than the dictates of men and that subscriptions are things much too sacred to be trifled with, or lightly submitted to. A very important sentence that we read on the top of page 109. This little sentence actually just summarizes what I have been saying earlier in this video and what I'm saying throughout all my, all my mist, uh, ministry. I'm going to repeat it once again to let it sink in and that you can really, I hope, perfectly understand this and otherwise read it for yourselves again. Whereas, the author says, in truth, subscriptions, subscriptions to the churches make amendments. Subscriptions are the great securities of such profligate wretches, who, by complying with them, enter into the church and thereby share in all the temporal 
advantages of it. Whilst the scrupulous, conscientious Christian is the only one she excludes, who thinks the word of God a more sure rule of faith than the dictates of men. This is what it is all about. Okay, <laughs> can't put that in a different color here. <laughs> Conscientious Christian is the only one she excludes who thinks the word of God, the Bible, a more sure rule of faith than the dictates of men, and that subscriptions are things much too sacred to be trifled with or lightly submitted to. Very important sentence. They are indeed very great squares, uh, sorry, they are indeed very great snares to many purpose and temptations to them too often to trespass upon the rules of strict honesty and virtue. For when means substance, substance, this means substance, and advantages in the world depend on their subscribing to certain articles of faith, Tis one of the most powerful arguments that can be to engage them to comply with it. Tis possible, indeed, they have their objections against the reasonableness, reasonableness and truth of what they are to subscribe, but will not interest often lead them to overlook their difficulties, to explain away the natural meaning of words, to put a different sense upon the articles than what they will fairly bear to take them in any sense and to subscribe them in no sense only as articles of peace it must be by some such evasions that arians subscribe to athanasian's creed and arminian to principles of rigid calvinism this the clergy have been again and again reproached with, even the enemies of Christianity. And I, am, and I am sorry to say it, they have not been able to wipe off the scandal from themselves. I am far from saying or believing that all the clergy may these eva uh, make these evasive subscriptions. Those only that do so, uh, those only that do so give this offence, and if they are, in other cases, men of integrity and conscience, they are objects of great compassion. As far as my own judgment is concerned, I think this manner of subscribing to creeds and articles of faith is infamous in its nature, and vindicable upon the principles of conscience and honour. It tends to render the clergy contemptible in the eyes of the people who will be apt to think that they have but little reason to regard the sermons of men who have prevaricated their subscriptions and that they preach for the same reason only that they subscribed, meaning their worldly interest. It is of a very pernicious influence and example and in its consequences leads to the breach of all faith amongst mankind and tends to the subversion of civil society. For if the clergy are known to prevaricate in subscribing to religious tests and orthodoxy, is it not to be feared that others may learn from them to prevaricate in their subscriptions to civil tests and law of loyalty? And indeed, there is a great deal of reason to imagine that if men can tutor and twist the consciences so as to subscribe to articles of faith, contrary to their own persuasion and only as articles of peace or a qualification for a living, they would subscribe for the same reason to popery or even Mohammedanism, means Islam. For if this be a good reason for subscribing any articles which I do not believe, there's a reason for subscribing all. And therefore I humbly apprehend that a practice which gives so much occasion to such scandalous prevarications with God and man should be cast off as an unsufferable grievance and as a yoke upon the necks of the clergy too heavy for them to bear.
Now let me add further that this practice of imposing subscriptions has been the occasion of innumerable mischiefs in the Church of God. It was the common cry of the Orthodox and Arians and all other heretics in their turn of power, either subscribe or depart from the churches. This inflamed the clergy against each other and filled them with hatred, malice and revenge. For as by imposing these subscriptions, inquisition was made into the consciences of others. The refusal to submit to them was a certain mark of heresy and reprobation, and the consequence of this was the infliction of all spiritual and temporal punishments. It was impossible but that such procedures should perpetuate the schisms and divisions of the Church. Uh, since the wrath of man cannot work in righteousness of God, and since civil punishments have no tendency to convince the conscience, but only to inflame the passions against the advisers and inflictors of them. And as ecclesiastical history gives us so dreadful an account of the melancholy and tragical events of this practice, one would think that no nation who knew the worth of liberty no Christian Protestant church that hath any regard for the peace of the flock of Christ should ever be found to authorize and continue it. Very important sentence. And everything that I just read in this very first paragraph on page 110 is an explanation of a few hundred years ago of what happened in the ecumenical movement of, to uh, movement of today. With Vatican II of the 1960s, subscribe to the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. That's what it's all about. But this last sentence is very interesting and we should really read it again. History gives us so dreadful an account of the melancholy and tragically, tragical events of this practice one would think that no nation who knew the, work, uh, the worth of liberty, United States of America, are you still in the possession of the knowledge what real liberty actually is or actually was that you had in the beginning, that you had in the time when you were consisting of the 13 colonies before the founding of the nation-state of America? Christ, that no nation who knew the worth of liberty because the 13 colonies knew what liberty was they didn't need the liberty of uh, or the freedom of religion that was put into the constitution they had that already but again this is going too far probably history gives us so dreadful an account of the melancholy and tragical events of this practice, one would think that no nation who knew the worth of liberty or no Christian Protestant church that had any regard for the peace of the flock of Christ should ever be found to authorize and continue it. Very important last sentence in this part 5 that we are reading and we are now turning to, as you can see, part 6 of this uh, subject that we are reading in the introduction here. What security then shall we have left us for truth and orthodoxy when our subscriptions are gone? When all the subscriptions that we adhere to are gone, what security shall we have for our truth? Why the sacred scriptures those oracles of the great God and freedom of liberty to interpret and understand them as we can. The consequence of this would be great integrity and, pre and peace of conscience and the enjoyment of our religious principles, union and friendship amongst Christians, notwithstanding all their differences in judgment and great respect and honor to those faithful pastors that carefully feed the flock of God and lead them into pastures of righteousness and peace. This is important. Okay? Why the sacred scriptures, 
those oracles of the great God and freedom of liberty, that is what the scripture is, freedom and liberty to interpret and understand them as we can. The consequence of this would be great integrity and peace of conscience. In the enjoyment of our religious principles, union and friendship amongst Christians, notwithstanding all the differences in judgment and great respect and honor to those faithful pastors that carefully feed the flock of God and lead them into pastures of righteousness and peace. We shall lose only the encumbrances of religion, our bones of convention, of contention, the shackles of our consciences, and the snares to honesty and virtue. Whilst all that is substantially good and valuable, all that is truly divine and heavenly would remain to enrich and bless us. The clergy would indeed lose their power to do mischief, but would they not be happy in their loss, especially as they would be infinitely more likely to do good? They would be no longer looked on as fathers, and they would be no longer looked on as dictators in the faith, but still they might remain ambassadors for Christ, beseeching men in Christ's stead to become reconciled to God. And was all human authority and matters of faith thus wholly laid aside, would not the word of God have a, a freer course and be much more abundantly glorified? All Christians would look upon Scripture as the only rule of their faith and practice, and therefore search it with greater diligence and care and be much more likely to understand the mind of God therein. It took us almost half an hour to read a sentence that really sums it up what I have been saying before. Yeah? All Christians would look upon Scripture as the only rule of their faith and practice, and therefore search the scripture with greater diligence and care and be much more likely to understand the mind of God therein. Now let me tell you just one little thing about what we just read here. Yeah? We read all Christians would look upon scripture as the only rule of their faith and, and practice. This is just what I've been saying before. Sola Scriptura. The Bible and the Bible alone. When Look, when, when I make videos like this, uh, of a book reading, or I upload videos from Tom Fress' um, Inquisition Update, doing his readings or doing explanations about the Church and about the ecumenical movement and about the wrong interpretation of Daniel's 70th week prophecy, especially Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27 and all that stuff. When all of these things I upload, there are always people who comment against that. Why? Because people are very often leaning more to believe what some people tell them instead of what they can read and confirm in the word of God itself, the Bible. So the point that the author is making here right now is exactly that. If all Christians would look upon scripture as the only rule of their faith and practice and therefore search it with greater diligence and care and be much more likely to understand the mind of God therein. We should only adhere to the scripture. All Christians would look upon Scripture as the only rule of their faith and practice. That's the point the author makes here. That's the point that I try to make all the time. The Bible and the Bible alone. Because it is the spoken word of God. Must be the pillar of our conscience. From beginning to end. Nothing else. And if somebody comes with another quote-unquote opinion, well then let's first see where he got that opinion from and secondly show him by studying scripture and showing him book, 
chapter and verse where he can find his error in. Christians are not to discuss each other because discussion always leads to quarrel. We are to debate the scripture, we are to talk about the scripture and see that we seek the right understanding. But first of all, if everybody would read the same Bible, and second of all, if we all read, of course, the King James Bible then, we would all be led by the same Spirit. And there would be no contention, but we would all be one in the body of Christ, as Christ told us to be. There would be no separation within the body of Christ, because we all adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura. I mean, this, this point must be made again and again and again and again. I, I still think um, uh, it's by grace alone, by faith alone, by scripture alone, and Christ alone, and, glory, uh, and all glory be to God. The middle one, by scripture alone. This is the one that you should take out of there. By scripture alone. In the scripture it is written, by grace, by faith, in Christ, and all glory to God. All the other points come in scripture. So when you adhere to scripture alone, to the Bible alone, sola scriptura, all the other points are being fulfilled automatically. And as the author said so righteously in uh, what we've just read here, all Christians would look upon Scripture as the only rule of their faith and practice and therefore search it with greater diligence and care and be much more likely to understand the mind of God therein because we would all be led by the same Holy Spirit and within that there is no contention and there is no separation. That's why I think this is a very, very important sentence. The main things of Christianity, the author continues, would unquestionably be generally agreed to by all. And as to other things, points of speculation and difficult questions, if Christians differed about them, that difference would be of no great importance and might be maintained consistent with charity and peace. Indeed, a strict and constant adherence to Scripture, as the only judge in controversies of Christian faith, would be the most likely method to introduce into the Church a real uniformity of opinion as well as practice. Now, one important sentence is chasing the other in, in what I am reading here. Yeah? I can't get enough of this. This is the point the author makes here. This is real unity, unity and truth. Nothing had to do with ecumenical movement. It only has to do with subscribing to one principle alone, sola scriptura. Indeed, the author says, a strict and constant adherence to scripture as the only judge in controversies of Christian faith would be the most likely method to introduce into the church a real uniformity of opinion as well as practice. For if this was the case, yeah, if we all adhered only to scripture, if this was the case, many disputes would be wholly at an end, as having nothing to give occasion to them in the sacred writings, and all others would be greatly shortened, as hereby all foreign terms and human phrases of speech, sophistry and casistry, by which the questions that have been con uh, controverted amongst Christians have been darkened and perplexed, would be immediately laid aside, and the only inquiry would be, what is the sense of Scripture? What the doctrine of Christ and his apostles? This is a much more short and effectual way of determining controversies than sending men to Nicaea and Chalcedon, to councils and synods, to Athanasius or Arius, to Calvin or Arminius, or any other persons whatsoever that can be mentioned, who at best deliver but their own sense of scripture, not the sense of the Holy Spirit, but their own sense of Scripture. 
and are not to be regarded any farther than they agree with it. It was a departure from this, as the great standard of faith and corrupting the simplicity of the gospel doctrine by hard unscriptural words that gave occasion to the innumerable controversies that formerly troubled the Christian church. Human creeds were substituted in the room of scripture, and according to circumstances differed, all the new opinions were broached. So were the creeds corrected, amended and enlarged, till they became so full of subtleties, contradictions and nonsense, as must make every thoughtful man read many of them with contempt. The controversy was not about scriptural expressions, but about the words of men. It was not about the sense of scripture, but the decrees of councils and the opinions of Athanasius, Leo, Cyril, and the venerable quote -unquote, fathers. And upon this foot it was no wonder that disputes should be endless, since the writings of all fallible men must certainly be more obscure and intricate than the writings of the infallible spirit of truth, who could be at no loss about the doctrines he dictated, nor for proper words suitably to express them. This infinite, this endless labor to consult, uh, uh, to consult all that the fathers have written. And when we have consulted them, what one controversy have they rationally decided? What on Christian doctrine have they clearly and solidly explained? How few texts of scripture have they critically settled the sense and meaning of? How often do they differ from one another? And in how many instances from themselves? Those who read them greatly differ in their interpretation of them, and men of the most contrary sentiments all claim them for their own. Athanasius and Arian appealed to the quote-unquote fathers and support their principles by quotations from them. And are these the venerable gentlemen whose writings are to be set up in opposition to the scripture? or set up as authoritative judges of the sense of scripture and creeds of their uh, oh, let's just, uh, and creeds of their decreting sorry and creeds of their decreting to be submitted to as the only criterion of orthodoxy or esteemed as standards to distinguish between truth and error? Away with this folly and superstition! Away with this folly and superstition! The creeds of the fathers and councils are but human creeds that have all the marks in them of human frailty and ignorance. The creeds which are to be found in the Gospel are the infallible dictates of the spirit of the God of truth, and as such claim our reverence and submission, and as the forming our principles according to them, as far as we are able to understand them, makes us Christians in the sight of God, not in the sight of man, but makes us Christians in the sight of God, it should be sufficient to everyone, to everyone's being owned as a Christian by others, without their using any inquisitory forms of trial, till they can produce their commission from heaven for the use of them. This, as it is highly reasonable in itself, would do the highest honor to the Christian clergy, who, instead of being reproached for haughtiness and pride, as uh, incendiaries and plagues of mankind, and the sowers of contention and strife, and disturbers of the peace of the Church of God, would be honored for their work's sake, esteemed for their characters, loved as blessings to the world, heard with pleasure, and successful in their endeavors to recommend the knowledge and practice of 
Christianity. This ends point 6 in the part of the history of the Inquisition that we are reading for the moment. And I have to stop here because you can see the next part is very difficult to read. I have to read before that. I have to prepare this here. And uh, I will end the video right here. We are a little bit less than one hour, but that's okay. We did about 40 minutes of reading, but that's okay. It was a intense reading. It was a very important reading. And it is a reading that absolutely expresses sola scriptura and the importance of sola scriptura and the adherence only to the word of God and not the adherence to the word of any man. Don't matter what man it is. It can be Luther, it can be Calvin, it can be Melanchthon, it can be Zwingli, it can be Cranmer, it can be Latimer, it can be Ridley. They're all men. And only God speaks the truth. And only God has the truth. And if we all adhere to sola scriptura, we will have no separation in the true body of Christ. And that is actually what the Reformation was all about. Bringing the true word of God to all people so that they could all see we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no clergy above us. There is no king above us. Except for the King that we adhere all to, Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But there is no earthly king, there is no earthly clergy, there is no earthly authority, there is no earthly hierarchy that we could adhere to, or that we should adhere to. This is the knowledge what the Reformation brought us. And because the Reformation brought this, the Jesuits were founded and their goal is to extirpate the Reformation, to extirpate Protestants, to extirpate the Word of God, to utterly demolish, destroy and take out of the world the Word of God, which will never happen. There will always be a small remnant but they have succeeded, especially with the ecumenical movement. And they have succeeded because they were using for centuries and centuries the Inquisition. What this whole book is going to be, and still is at this moment, all about. History of the Inquisition by Philip van Limborg. Written at the end of the 17th century. You know why I repeat that always? Written at the end of the 17th century? Because how many books have you ever been have you ever read that come from that time? How many books did you ever have the chance to read that come from that time and that tell you history from that point of view a few hundred years ago when there still was a little liberty in the education? Because there is no liberty in education today anymore, because it is all controlled and led and stirred by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Antichrist. Then, at that time, the Jesuits did not have the success and the power they have today, but they had, in the meantime, 300 years to get along with it. From the end of the 17th century until the beginning of the 21st. They have done their homework. Now let us do ours. By getting back to scripture and scripture alone. Until next time, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye bye.